Greetings and salutations. I am Jacob, and the purpose of this video is to describe the vision, uh, designs, and possible implementations of how I am developing a plan for increasing my own personal liberty and uh, decreasing the autonomy leakage that uh, uh, results from my uh, enmeshment with institutions of domination. I wish to share this vision and these designs and uh, possible implementations with you so that you may uh, revision, redesign, and adapt these ideas to what may serve your needs, values, and preferences. Uh, I feel that the intended audience for this video uh, is for the Liberty community in general, and I wish to contribute uh, to that audience things that I have found of value in potentially uh, decreasing my autonomy leakage uh, in pursuit of that holy grail of the full pressure autonomy shower that can wash away uh, some of the domination which can uh, stick to us, which is what I suspect what we are all looking for. If you are already a member of the Liberty community, I suspect that you probably already have spent a fair amount of time doing what my friend uh, Daryl Becker describes as uh, measuring tyranny. Uh, I suspect that you've spent much time and energy observing and thinking and researching and sharing about things like freedom, uh, liberty, rights, property, uh, or maybe possessions. Uh, self-ownership or self-possession, and perhaps even things uh, as abstract as uh, the non-aggression principle, or natural law, or natural rights, and maybe even regulatory capture and rent-seeking. Uh, you've probably spent a lot of time and energy becoming informed of current events and discussing the latest encroachment, infringement, uh, oppression and tyranny. My daughter's in the background. I hope that doesn't disturb you. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I suspect that you may have been even reading books on uh, political theory, ethics, uh, economics, philosophy, history, and other similar subjects. I suspect these things because I suspect that uh, I am very much the same as you in temperament and values and needs or at least that's the supposition I have of the intended audience of this production. In Korea. Okay. As I have uh, pursued my own attempts Jacob, at... Uh, Jacob, Yes, Anna? I, I have a present for you. You have a present for me? Why, thank you. Let me see this lovely present. Oh, it's very nice. What is it? It's a... It's a... Rock in there. There's a rock in there? No, there's a frog in there. There's a frog in there? Yeah, open yeah. it. Let me to open it? Okay. okay. Oh, there is a frog in there. <gasps> oh, a frog in the box. Okay. This will have to be edited. <laughs> As I pursued my own attempts at uh, measuring tyranny, I... Uh, I came across something that I now think of as an indispensable part of the Liberty Toolkit. And that tool is uh, known as nonviolent communication. And it, it's often abbreviated to be NVC. I uh, heard about NV, uh, nonviolent communication from a podcast uh, with the name of Complete Liberty by Wes Bertrand. And though it took uh, some time to overcome, uh, some of my skepticism, I came eventually to see NVC as a very potent tool not to understand liberty or measure tyranny, but rather to apply and implement my values of liberty and autonomy in my own life. And uh, this was a very exciting prospect because though I enjoyed sharing ideas of ethics and economics and political theory with others, NVC was really uh, potentially a means by which I could uh, create more autonomy in my own life. And when I was busy measuring tyranny and understanding the gamut of uh, philosophy of liberty, I found that, an, this, that this academic understanding did not necessarily increase my uh, own personal liberty experience or decrease my autonomy leakage. It merely gave me a, a greater appreciation for how severe that my autonomy leakage 
really was. And so this NVC, it really begins as a technique, um, but if it's practiced frequently enough, um, you become more fluent in it. It really becomes for you in the practice of NVC a different sort of consciousness, or maybe a different better way to say that is a different way of looking at things. In, in NVC, there is a conscious change in one's normal use of language to increase the potential for connection and the potential for empathy um, and the potential to increase uh, connection based on common humanity, uh, common humanness, and decrease the potential for disconnection and domination, you know, uh, communication, commune, occasion, is about a coming together, a commune, communion, a togetherness, a connection, a uh, mutual understanding. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm kind of uh, transfixed upon this, the, pref the prefix of communication. When I wish to communicate with someone, I am, uh, if I'm choosing to communicate with someone, then it's because I wish for us to have a coming together. I wish for us to connect, to have a mutual understanding. But if I begin using language that puts barriers between us, that creates conditions for disconnection, for a, you know, for a lack of mutual understanding, then my act of, my purpose of communication is working at odds with my actual use of language. And if I want to communicate with you, then I want us to come together. I want us to have a mutual understanding, a connection. And so this video really isn't about nonviolent communication, but since uh, NVC is kind of a, a paragon of the kind of empathy that I value and I wish to develop in my own life, I, uh, I wish to provide kind of a simplistic description of the kind of language that NVC seeks to cultivate, and perhaps uh, this is most easily done by maybe describing the kinds of language which the NVC practitioner would like to avoid. Uh, so, uh, as a kind of example of some expressions that the NVC practitioner would like to avoid, um, the first might be demands and ultimatums. And as persons who value liberty and autonomy, uh, I'm sure we are all intimately understand the disconnection and potential for conflict that can be fostered or created by demands. Very often, uh, demands can take the form of laws and regulations and codes, and uh, this is not very connecting stuff. Uh, there's a lot of punishment connected to demands, and uh, it's hard to feel connected to someone who is uh, threatening to punish you. Uh, the second type of expression that the NVC practitioner might like to avoid is uh, unrequested diagnoses, uh, evaluations, and labels. Um, you know, these kinds of things, uh, diagnoses, evaluations, and labels, they have a tendency to create a disconnection. Um, just as when we this is when we might not feel particularly connected to someone who might call us utopian, uh, or similarly how we do not find a lot of uh, empathic connections with others when we might evaluate someone else to be a, a statist. Um, you know, this kind of uh, unrequested diagnosis, unrequested evaluation, unrequested labeling uh, creates a, an us-them kind of barrier. It uh, decreases the chance for connection. Uh, connect a chance for communication decreases the chance for mutual understanding and uh, a, a third type of expression to be avoided uh, by an NVC practitioner would be uh, a deserve oriented language um, s examples might include uh, I deserve to be treated better or everyone deserves a free college education and uh, these are avoided because these descriptions seem to imply a denial of our own ability or power to make choices and meet our own needs. And additionally, they also kind of imply that others are responsible to make to ensure that our needs get met, which kind of, again, like kind of uh, decreases our power, decreases our autonomy, because it implies that we can't get our needs met unless these other people do this thing that we deserve. And uh, lastly, uh, NVC practitioner would, might like to av avoid language that denies responsibility. And we might be familiar with such uh, examples of this, such as, uh, I'm just doing my job. Or, uh, and, it's, and a rephrasing of that, I'm just doing my job, might be, I choose to conduct myself according to the guidelines of my employer. And so that, that expression would, might take more responsibility for uh, what's actually being done. Uh, I'm just doing my job implies that I have no choice, that I'm not making any choices, that I am just doing my job, pardon me, 
while saying, I choose to conduct myself according to the conduct uh, guidelines of my employer, is saying, well, this is a choice that I own. This is a choice that I take responsibility for. Um, other uh, more benign examples might be, uh, I can't make it tomorrow. And uh, you might rephrase that to, have, to, to express that you're making a choice, to say that I choose to make alternate arrangements for tomorrow. Or perhaps uh, a common expression of, I have to go to the store, might be rephrased to take responsibility for that, is I choose to go to the store so that I might have a well-stocked pantry and uh, have uh, readily accessible food for the coming week. So this is kind of ways to rephrase uh, these expressions, to take responsibility for them, to uh, imply uh, the choices that are being made. So uh, I hope that uh, gives you a little bit of an idea about what NVC is about. And uh, if you are interested in, it, in NVC specifically, I invite you to uh, contact me, uh, maybe through this YouTube channel, and uh, I'll try to get uh, people set up uh, uh, for the uh, NVC for Persons with the High Autonomy Needs Hangouts that often take place on Google Plus um, a couple times a week. And uh, the, these Hangouts on Google Plus are kind of a free video conferencing chat in which, uh, in, which in this case, uh, liberty-minded persons interested in NVC uh, meet their needs for connection and exploring how NVC uh, might meet their needs for uh, empathy and autonomy. So. NVC, as you might guess, is kind of a really exciting uh, practice for me because it has the potential, I hope, uh, to develop an internal connection with myself, an awareness of my own feelings and needs that I can be conscious of and express to others in real time. You know, I'm feeling like, for instance, I'm, I'm feeling irritated right now. Um, I really have a need for some space and some quiet and this kind of thing. And that might be a more authentic, honest um, expression than, will you please shut up? <laughs> so you might see how that could go. Um, and I'm hoping that when I'm, uh, when I'm kind of centered like this, when I'm empathizing with my feelings and needs, um, when I'm authentically connected to what's alive with me, when I'm connected to my own feelings and needs, I can truly communicate then with others. And I can cultivate that kind of connectedness that I'm looking for. Again, the, the, the create this connection. Uh, with NVC, I can have a greater self-connection, and I can also have, after I create that self-connection, I can have perhaps supercharged, awesome relationships with others, like this girl right here. What? And, uh... What do I have? What do you have? You have a doggy toy, huh? This might also have to hit the cutting room floor. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> when, uh... I'm uh, connected to myself and connected to my own feelings and needs. I can create that those uh, create. I can have that se authentic self connection, and I can have a supercharged, awesome relationship with others, while having full authenticity, um, without having to dwell with uh, in the <laughs> in the valley of blame and shame and guilt, uh, without me, having me demands. Dirt. Me eat the dirt. You can maybe dirt later, okay? Okay. Okay. Whoosh, editing magic. <laughs> so, uh, with NVC, um, yeah, NVC is a really exciting uh, practice for me uh, because I feel that it has the potential to develop for me uh, an internal connection with myself, an awareness of my own feelings and needs that I can be conscious of and express in real time. Uh, that I'm able to provide myself with a kind of self empathy that uh, can help me be centered and connected again to my own feelings and needs. And from there, I can really truly communicate with others um, and cultivate the kind of empathic connectedness that I'm looking for. With uh, NVC or something like it, I can have a, a greater connection and I can have perhaps uh, supercharged, awesome relationships with others and all while having uh, full authenticity without uh, dwelling in blame, shame, and guilt, without uh, using demands. Um, or without using uh, deserve-oriented language, without unrequested diagnoses, uh, evaluations, uh, judgments, and uh, with uh, taking full responsibility for my choices. And prior to my interest in NVC, I had pursued a fairly uh, indirect route to my own personal liberty. I had uh, selected a strategy in which I would 
attempt to persuade others of the ideas that I found of value in the hopes of contributing to a, a social revolution in which all persons might have that full pressure autonomy and uh, be free of the institutions of domination. And along the way, I met uh, lots of great people online, and as well as having uh, my share of unpleasant discussions with those who I might have at the time have evaluated as statists, right? Um, in which they would have likewise uh, wanted to attempt to persuade me, uh, or they would have liked to persuade me uh, of the social necessity of uh, a state or a social contract and, uh, and other ideas and models which did not seem to meet my needs for understanding or meet the needs uh, that I had for integrity to my own values. And so the upside of uh, this persuasion strategy was that I met lots of great people who shared similar values. And the downside was that I generally did not feel very satisfied uh, with the discussions I was having with uh, people who I uh, did not already tend to share lots of agreement with. And, uh, and having had, personally, myself, a background in philosophy, I felt that I was fairly well equipped to communicate uh, using reason and evidence, uh, argumentation and observation. And yet, if the purpose of persuading people that uh, they would be well served by valuing the autonomy of individuals was to create some uh, mass change in the opinion towards a uh, social revolution, you know, uh, even with a background in philosophy and more collegiate courses than I wish to recount, if I still was not making much progress, then uh, I had my doubts. I started having my doubts as to whether this strategy of indirect persuasion, yeah, this indirect persuasion strategy was really going to be uh, efficacious to achieve uh, my goals of personal autonomy. And NVC was exciting because it seemed to be just like the thing I was looking for. It was doable. It was actionable. It had the potential to make my life better now, uh, and not in some hopeful but indefinite future, but today. And so I began thinking, wow, uh, seeing the connection between liberty, autonomy, and nonviolent communication requires a bit of a vision of the future. And I can already see this kind of application becoming fully realized and expressed in the Liberty community uh, from the emphasis of peaceful parenting uh, by the Blue Ridge Liberty Project to the extension of psychology into the discussion of ethics that uh, we see in the work of Stefan Molyneux and the Free Domain Radio community. And uh, as I extended that thinking towards if connecting the humanness of feelings and emotions and psychology towards curiosity, empathy, understanding, and connectedness is a burgeoning field of the liberty community, what might be the next step? What's the next step of this vision? And in that process of wondering, I began to see all of the valuable academic work, you know, uh, Mises.org and Center for Stateless Society, um, in the realm of philosophy, ethics, political theory, um, economics and history to be all part of this macro social sphere and uh, this macro social sphere dealing with systems and institutions and societies and uh, these newly emergent applications of liberty dealt with a micro social sphere they dealt with our personal social interactions how we deal with other individuals how we interact with our friends our beloveds our children our co-workers and as I contemplated what the next great step towards autonomy might be, I became focused on the idea that it would involve our interaction with the web of things around us. It would be a connection between the me now and the me in the future. Uh, and then, you know, and then my children in the future after there is no more me. And this, and then a, and a paradigm became apparent to me and the paradigm that I was looking at this next trying to re trying to envision what the next step of uh, the application of liberty autonomy might be was the paradigm of uh, domination versus cooperation and so this came to mind as something that connected these that connected these macro and social and micro spheres um, domination in the macro social was all about demands all about violence coercion expropri expropriation 
uh, domination in the microsocial sphere was all about kind of manipulations, ex exploitations, the denial of responsibility, the making of personal demands, um, making unrequested diagnoses, evaluations, and judgments, and, uh, and using deserve-oriented language. Such that uh, the domination of the microsocial and the macrosocial was all about outcomes in which somebody wins at the expense or sacrifice of somebody else who loses. And my study of uh, the Austrian School of Economics impressed upon me a, uh, a more preferable arrangement, uh, an arrangement where there could be mutually beneficial interactions. There could be uh, uh, symbiosis. There could be um, mutually beneficial uh, stuff, a win-win. So I envisioned the next great step in the evolution towards liberty and autonomy would deal with the individual's interaction with the interconnected web of things in a way that would be cooperative and win-win instead of uh, uh, dom uh, dominative or win-lose. And it became clear to me that certain kinds of communities uh, were, that were uh, already concerned with ecology perhaps represented this kind of win-win that I was looking for. Uh, but especially in the communities of the, the biointensive, uh, the biodynamic, and, and also especially permaculture. And so uh, I began an exploration of the permaculture and uh, design field, and I, did, I explored that a little more fully. And I realized that this field was full of actionable, doable strategies to help a person realize their own personal autonomy. And the permaculture community have already spent a great deal of energy investigating and sharing how people could produce much of their own food in ways that had minimal labor inputs and yet yields that were significantly higher than even uh, conventional agriculture. You know, if you, you know, compared uh, uh, square foot to square foot. And yet these practices were also regenerative or healing of the soil and the ecology uh, rather than extractive and uh, dominative of the soil ecology. The, the, purple, the permaculture community also spent uh, much of their energies investigating and sharing ways uh, for people to design and construct their own housing out of natural materials that would be more energy efficient um, than conventional homes at just a fraction of the cost. Uh, the permaculture community had explored how to heat those homes with some really interesting uh, low-tech, ultra-efficient uh, wood heat and create hot water using the heat from compost piles or solar uh, water heaters and how to harvest rainwater and manage gray water and uh, black water. And along the way, I realized that not only these strategies and techniques, actionable ways that you and I can implement in our own lives to save ourselves uh, uh, cost and money, but that if our housing costs could be made one-fifth or even one-tenth of what they are now, if our heating costs could be one-tenth or one-twentieth of what they are now, suddenly some of us in the Liberty community might be able to live uh, very comfortably on a fraction of our current income. Or we might uh, retire much earlier at our current income. And I started thinking that even if a small percentage of the Liberty community were able to implement and um, implement the value of autonomy in ways which were cooperative in their micro-social lives through uh, NVC or something else like NVC. And if some of us would also uh, live lives that were connected to a cooperative interaction in the eco-social sphere with permaculture or something like permaculture, that uh, we might be able to pay less income tax uh, because we might have less need for income. We might pay less in sales because uh, we might use uh, cryptocurrencies like bitcoins, uh, litecoins, and some alternate cryptocurrencies like Jerusalem artichokes, uh, apios groundnuts, uh, or perennial kale, or agroforestry, because, uh, you know, the tax man doesn't yet know how to tax your garden, and your service berries are kind of anonymous. Um, they just aren't always the best mediums of exchange, so they don't make the best cryptocurrencies, but they are kind of crypto in that uh, institutions of domination don't know yet how to extract uh, that value out of you. Uh, maybe they'll figure it out in the future, but uh, right now uh, they don't. So I began envisioning uh, people in the Liberty community finding autonomy, not after the next election or after the social revolution in which a majority of persons are persuaded that valuing liberty would be uh, 
best for everyone, but that the liberty community could begin carving out some autonomy for themselves. Now we could disconnect ourselves from all those institutions which are themselves enmeshed you know, with institutions of domination. We can uh, disconnect ourselves from the perhaps the power company by generating our own electricity. Uh, we can disconnect. We can uh, disconnect ourselves from the the natural gas company or the electric company from our uh, by creating our our own heat. Uh, we can connect ourselves from enmeshment from the banks that are dependent upon the Federal Reserve and build inexpensive houses without mortgages. Uh, we could grow our own food and perhaps. Uh, less expensively than we could buy it, and yet it will be the freshest, healthiest, best-tasting produce that we can imagine, and perhaps be less connected to institutions that involve things like regulatory capture and rent-seeking, like uh, <coughs> Monsanto! And uh, perhaps this even helps us not uh, need the medical institutions, uh, which are so enmeshed with institutions of domination right now through uh, socialization of medical care. So, uh, yeah, I would like to suggest that the better part of persuasion may be demonstration. That, you know, in my experience may be different from yours, but I have not found the strategy of persuasion with reason and evidence to be very effective or satisfying uh, personally. Um, I enjoyed meeting great people, but uh, trying to uh, make intellectual connections with people who, with whom I don't uh, already share lots of agreement was not always very satisfying. So uh, I did not find persuasion with reason and evidence to be very uh, effective or satisfying as a strategy to affect my own personal autonomy. But I'm wondering if demonstration might be more, uh, more effective, because de maybe demonstration is a little more passive. Persuasion might imply something like, trust me, this is right because I have these reasons or this evidence. Or perhaps persuasion might imply, believe me, because if these were ideas were applied, if they were implemented across the board, it would be better for everyone. Or, uh, you should agree with me because this makes more sense and this is more logically consistent. So persuasion is a little uh, active. It's maybe a little, uh, it can be perhaps, a little aggressive. And, uh, and many times the act of persuasion implies uh, that the persuader uh, presumes that those with differing opinions are wrong and the persuader is right. And even if this is the case, it doesn't bring people together. So even if you are right and they're wrong, okay, but, you know... Implying that it doesn't necessarily bring people together. It kind of creates divisions. It creates that I'm the right pe I'm I'm I have the right ideas and the right opinions, and you have the wrong ones, and you need to be persuaded of the of the right ones. And um, I'm not saying that persuasion has to be that way, but uh, it I think in my experience at least it often is. Uh, so there, so that's the kind of my idea that uh, that this idea of uh, right and wrong thinking may not be very connecting and it creates barriers between the persuader and uh, the people with whom the persuader would like to communicate or commune with or connect with. If we want to communicate, if we want to connect, then throwing up barriers may be counterproductive. Um, so there's still room to share ideas. There's still idea room to share ideas. There's still I I room to contribute ideas, but to pull someone over to your opinion by persuasion May not be. Yes, yes, Anna. My eggs hatched. Your eggs hatched. That's wonderful. Okay. I don't know if this will be the magic of editing again, and I'll cut this out. But uh, I want to say that you know I am here with Anna. I am here with Anna, and she's awake. And if I waited for Anna to be asleep, then I may never get a video done. Come here, come here, come I think she wants me to come with her. So it looks like we are going to have to edit come some of this. Come here. Um, okay, let's go. Let's go. But yeah, if I don't, uh, if I don't do it when she's awake, then I'll never get these videos done. Yes, baby. What do we need? So, yeah. Um, if we want to connect, if we want to communicate with others, if we want to commune with them, connect with them, if we want to share our ideas, contribute our ideas, then that's wonderful. 
but to you know persuade them that uh, they are wrong and we are right may may be counterproductive. It may not be um, the best uh, strategy if what we want is uh, happiness and if what we want is liberty. Um, demonstration, on the other hand, it seems a little more passive. It doesn't necessarily have that uh, that right wrong type of implication. Um, Demonstration seems more open to possibilities. Demonstration implies, look at this cool thing I built. It helps me save money. This is a rocket mass heater. It heats your house with sticks. You know, you don't need to chop firewood. You feed it sticks. And uh, yeah, if you build, if you were to buy, I could show you how to build one. And if you were to build one too, maybe you could save money. You know, so demonstration reaches directly to the need. It gives the person the space they need to process and make a decision. It, I don't know where your turtle is. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, I gotta go again. Okay, we're gonna find a turtle. More editing magic. Um, so yeah, demonstration reaches directly to the need, and it gives a person the space they need to perhaps process and make a decision, to perhaps the space they need to change their mind in a way in which they don't have to say, I was wrong. They just have to say, I am going to adopt this new wonderful thing. I'm going to add more right to me. So it's not that I was wrong and now I'm right. We're a persuasion that kind of sets up a situation where um, if I am to be persuaded, I have to eventually acknowledge that I'm wrong, that I was wrong, and that now I am adopting a new, better thing. Whereas demonstration is like, it's not about whether I was right or wrong before, it's I'm adopting a new, better thing. And so it, it, it overcomes that perhaps that hurdle of saying, oh yeah, crap, that, that didn't make much sense, or I want to uh, I like this idea better. It just says, uh, I'm going to add something wonderful to my life. And, uh, yeah, demonstration shows how it will meet a need. And rather than perhaps uh, the, the, in persuasion, there's maybe a promise of meeting a need. Uh, and I think that's highly dependent on trust. So persuasion really works, I think, maybe a lot better when there's a lot of trust between people. And when there's not so much trust, when it's more anonymous, maybe persuasion isn't so... Um, effective. Well, that's my experience at least. So uh, I began developing this vision about building myself a homestead and by buying some land and to begin developing that land using uh, permaculture de design techniques and my friend Daryl who I mentioned earlier <laughs> uh, Daryl began suggesting to me the idea of creating an intentional community. And it took me a while to come Jacob, around. Jacob. Yes, Anna? The egg hatched. The egg hatched? Yeah. Wow. Come on, come on. Okay. We have to we have to go again and see this egg. Editing magic. <laughs> so uh, my friend Daryl, uh, who I mentioned earlier about uh, measuring tyranny, uh, began suggesting the idea of creating uh, an intentional community. Um, as I spoke to him about my homesteading idea. And it took me a while to come around to this, uh, but eventually I began thinking of this idea as a strategy that brings everything else together. A, a community is a macro-social structure. Uh, within that community, individuals interact, and this composes the micro-social sphere. And if these individuals each seek win-win interactions with the land upon which they inhabit, uh, they create needs meeting connections between their present selves and their future selves as Jacob, well. Jacob, Jacob. Yes, baby. The turtle is trapped. The turtle is trapped? Yeah. Okay. Come on, come on. <sighs> editing magic. Sorry about all these little editing magic stops. Uh, child care issues. Uh, my daughter needs me and uh, she wants to interact with me and so it draws me away. But uh, if I can remember where it was I speaking of. <laughs> All these stops and starts. Um, if I can express to you that um, I'm beginning to feel a little uh, frustration because I want to get this video done and um, a little irritation at the amount of uh, stops and starts. And so, yeah, I can, I'm aware of these, these feelings and, um, and I'm trying to meet my need to connect with you and uh, share and contribute ideas. And so I really want to meet these needs and... Um, and so, yeah, so now I've empathized with myself. I'm like, yeah, I can understand why I might have these feelings if I'm trying to meet these needs. So uh, just to give you an idea of maybe kind of the mental role that NVC might help yeah, for what it's worth. So, yeah, 
intentional community as a expression uh, and full integration. Editing magic. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, intentional. As I thought about homesteading, Daryl uh, mentioned the intentional community. I saw the intentional community as a uh, as a fulfillment, as an integration of the macro, uh, micro, and eco spheres. Um, and I began envisioning an intentional community in which individuals each seek win-win interactions with uh, each other and with uh, the land upon which they inhabit and they create a, uh, a ne they create needs meeting connections between their present selves and their future selves as well as uh, any other possible children and I began thinking that though uh, the, the, the free state project is a, is a wonderful um, idea it's an idea that is out in the intermediate future uh, or the indeterminate future while a uh, free micro village might be something that you or I may be, able, may be able to accomplish in just a few years by intentionally creating the kind of communities that we would like to live in. And much like Galt's Gulch, uh, creating an intentional community filled with uh, wonderful people who share the same values of liberty and autonomy, who seek to use empathy to foster authentically rich and intimate relationships, and who do so in ecologically regenerative ways uh, ways would have created a community which might be like living in an enhanced uh, perennial pork fest, you know. So, so that's my that's my vision. That's my vision statement. That's uh, kind of the history of how I arrived from there to here. And I'm envisioning a uh, micro village composed of uh, several households uh, or families. Um, each living in modest but independent dwellings and a bit of independently controlled land um, which surround a much larger community structure and community space with a large kitchen and a dining hall and uh, perhaps a, a, a dance hall and play space. Um, I'm envisioning a place where I am good friends with all of my neighbors and we share common values. I'm envisioning a place where my two daughters can play safely with other children and safely explore their surroundings. I'm envisioning a community that values peaceful parenting and unschooling. I'm envisioning that some adults will probably be, be telecommuting to work. Um, others will maybe be having a short commute to work. Others will uh, potentially be operating various agorist businesses and still yet others might be involved, uh, more involved in growing plants and animals for food. More of a direct living off the land type of thing. I am envisioning a place where teenagers might have the autonomy uh, to be able to build their own small houses and have a sort of independence even while they still need the nurturing care and support of their parents. Um, kind of a transition home type of thing from childhood to adulthood. I'm envisioning a place where the costs of living are so reduced that there is a kind of elegant poverty. A, uh, a poverty on paper uh, but with a richness and fulfillment of a life well lived, well experienced. And uh, that's the vision. And so now uh, I'd like to describe the directions that I'm looking for to accomplish that vision. Um, first, I'll need to save money for a piece of land in uh, some kind of rural area. Rural because these areas tend to have the least restrictions on land use, giving these initial attempts to realize this vision the greatest chance of successful fruiting without uh, institutions of domination coming in and, uh, well, doing what institutions of domination do, you know, make you sad. So, uh, ideally, the land would be in a rural area with uh, some small city uh, not too far away and a place with relatively little to no zoning and little to no building codes or at least little to no enforcement of building codes. Uh, you know, zoning codes often restrict the number of persons living on one piece of land, and building codes 
might restrict the kind of experimentation in uh, dwelling structures that would be safe and expensive and energy efficient, as well as maybe perhaps ecologically sound. So ideally, this, uh, this land would consist of 10 to perhaps as much as 50 acres and be situated on uh, a southern slope with uh, some continuous flow of water, either a stream or spring, on the high to mid elevations of the property. And uh, as this kind of the southern slope creates a good solar exposure for growing plants, as well as collecting solar energy for the passive heating of, of homes, uh, the flow of water, especially if a cold water spring, allows for the immediate means of refrigeration using a spring house. Um, also provides water perhaps for drinking, um, for livestock, for creating ponds and aquaculture, and other kinds of water retainment and storage, and perhaps even irrigation. Uh, the soil should be a good mix of clay, silt, sand, and hummus, uh, and not used, and not having been used for conventional agriculture, uh, at least in the last few decades. The land should have a significant stand of trees in the 20 to 40 year age range um, to be used as building materials, uh, coppiced, you know, cut at a, a relatively high height um, for the production of poles and posts and additional sticks for firewood. And uh, in this area at least, around south of here, the average price for the kind of land I'm looking for is between 3,000 per acre, uh, which means uh, for a 10 acre parcel, I might expect to pay uh, $30,000. Um, and uh, I might be able to save as much as uh, $10,000 a year. And uh, $10,000 might give me sufficient funds to negotiate for some owner financing where the land might be transferred to me while I pay some uh, monthly or yearly payment to the owner to discharge the debt of uh, the remaining value of the land that was uh, transferred to me. So the owner essentially becomes uh, my bank, so to speak, my lender. I might also choose to pursue a strategy of crowdsourcing through things like uh, Indiegogo, but I have yet to fully explore that space and that opportunity. Um, so we'll see how that goes. You know, I have a thought to create some kind of thing that uh, people call a nonprofit corporation, to which uh, I might transfer ownership of the property uh, to this uh, nonprofit uh, corporation thing. Uh, playing uh, interesting little status games or institutional <laughs> institutions of domination games which might uh, further reduce the potential uh, tax liabilities as well as uh, tax liabilities as well as uh, possible civil liabilities um, yeah yeah so in the first year in the land I would then set up uh, editing in the first year on the land I plan to set up a, a temporary structure that I could work out of. Um, maybe such something such as a canvas teepee or a canvas yurt or maybe a canvas cabin tent and uh, something that I could leave up between visits and uh, that which would reduce uh, the need to set up a shelter or a tent each time I visit the land. I could just drive up and uh, start unpacking. Uh, I plan to divide up my time and energy into uh, uh, planting tree, trees and shrub seeds to develop uh, agroforestry or food forestry as well as uh, hedges that might produce some food products, you know, they're called fedges, while creating some fencing around the property which would eventually create paddocks in which livestock may be grazing uh, a few years later. And also I would like to divide my time between that and building uh, hugoculture swales that will capture and store rainwater in the soil itself to reduce any need for irrigation. Um, and building, and also dividing my time between building some small shacks or hovels of perhaps uh, 60 to 75 square feet out of uh, waste resources such as uh, wooden pallets, for instance. And if I could build three to five uh, small shacks out of pallets, and then I could begin extending uh, invitations to potential community members to come visit the land and uh, use these sh shacks as shelters to basically come and camp, camp out, and visit and see if this place seems to meet their needs um, and their interests. Um, you know, during these uh, camp outs, as people visit, I expect to, you know, have discussions as to how we might work out the kind of community that we would like to live in 
and develop uh, the kind of guidelines for the kind of community expectations, and as well as uh, you know eventually build a, uh, a large community pavilion around these small shacks, which could be like a, a nice community space to cook and uh, to dine and uh, to uh, relax on a rainy day and not be cooped up in a small space. So that might be like what happens the first year. And in the second or third year in the land, I would like to begin building what are known as Ehler structures. Um, you know, pictures like this. Now you might imagine an Ehler structure as like a combination of a log cabin and a hobbit house. Um, these Ehler structures are earth sheltered pole structures with green roofs on tops on top which grasses and wildflowers are grown so I would eventually uh, begin planning to build uh, some small Ehler structures and uh, for those of you not familiar with an Ehler structure imagine something like a log cabin um, and a hobbit house it is a an earth sheltered pole structure upon which there is a green roof, a, a roof with soil on top in which grass and wildflowers grow. And these are have an enormous amount of thermal mass due to the earth sheltering and uh, they would ha be uh, very cool in the summer and you can keep them very nice and toasty and warm in the winter time. And so after some experience building one or two of these Ehler structures of about a hundred square feet in the second or third year on the land I could begin extending invitations to membership uh, in the community with people who have camped out and who I've developed a really good relationship with. And uh, those first few Ehler structures would hopefully become, be, become I'm sorry, these, those first few Ehler structures would hopefully be comfortable living spaces year-round out of which community members could build their own larger dwellings of perhaps 500 to 800 square feet. Uh, in the third or fourth or fifth year, perhaps there begins to uh, form a secondary ring of these larger dwellings, these larger alien structures of the 500 to 800 square feet. And this might become a secondary pod to the community, a secondary part to the community. So, yeah, during the third, fourth, and maybe fifth years, uh, as people are using the small Ehler structures to build these larger Ehler structures, or maybe they're building cob houses, or maybe they're building straw bale homes, or maybe they're building cordwood masonry homes. Um, as people build their own slightly larger structures of the 500 to 800 square feet, um, these larger structures form a secondary pod, a secondary community on the land, and um, a, a, a larger community building uh, perhaps this one is not going to be an open-air community building. Maybe this one will be, um, you know, something that will be nice and toasty and warm in the wintertime. And maybe this larger community building will be in the neighborhood of 3,000 square feet with a full kitchen and a, and a, and a large dining hall and perhaps an, um, a, uh, also a dance hall and play space as well as bathhouses and a laundry space. And perhaps over time, a hot tub and a sauna are added to this community space in perhaps the fifth or sixth year. And by the fifth year, uh, that first area with pallet shacks, or maybe even in the third year, that first area with the pallet shacks and a few canvas structures, teepees, yurts, uh, canvas uh, cabin tents, um, and maybe a few small alias structures, this first pod or uh, becomes... Uh, likely to this 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 part this pod takes on the likely to take on a campground type character and I expect there will be um, as more permanent residents move into this uh, the secondary pod I expect that the first pod of the shacks and the canvas structures will become kind of a a transient liber liberty couch surfing uh, might be taking place um, perhaps some interns uh, move in um, Perhaps it becomes a place where young people uh, would come and stay during the pleasantly warm seasons. And uh, the small alia structures would continue to serve to provide prospective members a year-round place to stay as they build, build their own homes. You know, I would, li would like to develop the community membership guidelines in, in conjunction with others and a consensus-based process that everyone's agreed, agreeable to um, everything that happens, but um, I'm guessing, I'm suspecting, I'm envisioning that uh, that there would be uh, that 
I'm I'm <laughs> so uh, I would like to develop uh, the community the, mem the community membership guidelines in conjunction with uh, the other potential members. Uh, but what I'm I'm suspecting or envisioning would be that um, as soon as a person or family had spent a certain amount of time on the land, um, getting to know everyone and exploring to see if these potential prospective com community member would be a good fit for the community. Um, as a more permanent resident, that uh, after a certain amount of time had gone by and everyone felt good about it and there was consensus that this person, you know, everyone wants them to be a permanent member, that upon being a member of the community, um, that all members would participate in, the, uh, in a consensus-based community decision-making process uh, such that uh, no individual's needs need be sacrificed to meet the needs of others. And the idea would be for each member to, a member household would have uh, like a 99-year lease or uh, on something likely to be like a quarter of an acre um, with the possibility of uh, making uh, exchanges for additional leases for up to one to three acres depending on the available land and how many people um, the community would like to have at its peak point. And um, there may be, um, I don't know, what the, uh, you know, costs might have to work out. It'll depend on what the community wants, you know. It, perhaps they're, you know, after the initial debt for the land is discharged, um, perhaps there's like no lease, monthly lease fee, um, and the, each individual person, family, household just kind of does what they want with their finances. Or maybe they want to pitch in a certain uh, minimal amount, uh, maybe $100 a month uh, towards the community uh, to provide community meals, uh, like shared meals, or to pay um, uh, children or interns to do uh, farm work or any number of community things to improve the land for everyone. Um, but again, it would be based on a consensus process. Each member would have about would have a 99-year lease on about a quarter acre with the possibility of exchanging for additional leases. You know, so that uh, you know, if you wanted, you could have up to you know one to three acres, uh, depending on the amount of available land and how many people uh, the community would like to have at its peak point. And extending this vision uh, out further into the future, uh, perhaps yet a third pod is a, a third part of the community is extended out further, and uh, perhaps another community is formed deeper into the property in which members might build even larger homes and create another community structure, and that the mid-successional place becomes uh, a place that uh, might be uh, released to other new members or perhaps for, to uh, family members um, who are uh, retiring and looking for uh, a place to stay. Or these could be guest houses that, you know, uh, you, when your family wants to visit for, since you're living in a very small house, it'd be hard to uh, host and guest uh, family, to, family to come over. And so unless they stay in one of the shacks or they stay in uh, maybe part of the bunking area of uh, one of the community houses, um, perhaps uh, as we move into these larger houses, the smaller uh, 500 to 800 square foot structures become guest houses or, again, they become, you know, released properties or sublease, sublet properties or sublet uh, parcels or houses, dwellings. Sorry, this video is getting kind of long for me, as I'm sure it is for you, um, although, but so yeah, I'm experiencing some tiredness. Um, some of my energy is uh, declined and mellowed somewhat, so hopefully I'm going to wrap this up soon. So, so the vision I have is uh, to have a place for the young and transient, this first pod, transient, um, this first pod, who may have high needs for celebration and high tolerance for noise and change. And, um, and another community uh, that would be composed mostly of families with children and in a second pod. And then yet a third uh, pod um, of persons who are at or near a stage of retirement who would like uh, lots of peace, um, but where anyone at any time, or, you know, where, where anyone at, at any time could visit the other pods of the community. And if, for instance, you want some rest and relaxation, you might go to a quieter spot in the community and you might uh, set up a hammock or a tent by yourself with just a few friends and do some camping out, you know. Or if you felt uh, the need for celebration, perhaps you might go to another pod where there might be a drum circle or people playing music. Or perhaps uh, you might organize a dance 
on a Friday night with uh, community members playing music or maybe inviting the local town or village to come participate at the pavilion. Um, there seems to me to be lots of opportunity in this space to meet uh, the needs of uh, the present mood um, in such a community. And so this is the design of the vision. Um, you know, one micro village consisting of one to three pods where people perhaps commute to work or telecommute or run their own small businesses like a maybe tree trimming or wood cutting business or blacksmithing or welding or uh, wooden furniture maker or any number of agorist ventures online or otherwise. And uh, I also envision using the property to conduct uh, educational classes on how to build ecologically symbiotic structures, how to build solar dehydrators, uh, smoke houses or spring houses, uh, how to make sausage or construct swales or ponds or how to raise fish using aquaculture or how to can uh, vegetables or produce or how to ferment vegetables. Perhaps uh, a pavilion built near the road uh, might be used for this, uh, these kind of educational purposes. And uh, this kind of uh, outreach, I hope, would not only connect the community to the larger community, uh, the village or town in which it inhabits, to the spirit of this micro-village community, and I'm hoping that this would uh, ease tensions, perhaps uh, reduce the uh, potential for seclusion and isolation, and therefore alienation. And um, it would also perhaps earn members income, you know. Perhaps you could teach a class on how to blow glass, or how to work bronze, or whatever your interests are and aptitudes are, you know, with 10 or 5 to 10 students paying $25 per student for maybe a short uh, class, or maybe a $100 per student for an all-day class, perhaps just teaching a single class a month at the pavilion might be enough income for some members to live off of, you know, if they've they have cheap food and you know inexpensive housing and no uh, utilities uh, maybe that's enough to get by and so if what I've described so far has your interest if um, you know I would like to suggest that you could do the same thing that I'm planning in the area which you are uh, you perhaps you know perhaps you don't have you don't like uh, some part of my vision um, well, I would invite and welcome you to revision, redesign, and adapt all of these ideas, any of these ideas, to something that might better meet your needs and interests. And, you know, I'm just thinking that this direction seems to me to be a beautiful strategy for meeting my own needs, for autonomy and liberty, and I just like, I'm just, I'm just grooving on the idea of growing old with friends. Um, in a space where my children would thrive, where perhaps there is so much entrepreneurial spirit that my children, you know, or all the children, become full members of the community themselves someday, leasing their own parcels, or perhaps starting a whole new community somewhere, building their own dwellings, having their own businesses. I, I really like the idea of, of having shared meals at least a few times a week, uh, or perhaps even j just drinking coffee with friends in the morning in the dining hall as we prepare for our daily work um, at sunrise. Um, I like the idea of living in a community that not only val all, you know shares my values of personal autonomy, but also empathy and personal interactions with an intimate connection between persons through an authentic consciousness of feelings and needs uh, that we might all celebrate and enjoy each other's humanness and humanity. Um, I'm also very attracted to this idea of doing all this in a way in which the soil is regenerated, um, in which the eco ecology is benefited, in which chickens might be able to express their full chickenness in a, in a, in a paddock. Um, you know, in kind of a free-ranging paddock type situation, um, in a, in within a community that cares for themselves uh, in the now, that takes care of their needs in the now, but also takes care of their needs in the future, um, takes care of their children's needs in the future, um, and while building a, a place of healing that their uh, their children might even inherit. So, so yeah, my energy levels are a little mellowing, and so I just like to say that that's the deal, that's the vision. That's kind of the design and the possibilities for implementation. I hope that the integration of these ideas has inspired you to um, and gotten you thinking about how you could create just a little slice of this kind of awesomeness for yourself. And I hope that you will see the value in building good things for yourself in the present 
rather than spending energy being angry at all the bad things that are happening everywhere. And uh, I hope that the liberty community might evolve past uh, this measuring of tyranny, which is perhaps a necessary first step, but uh, they may then evolve and proceed towards creating something good, creating autonomy for themselves in the now. And uh, thank you so much for watching.